click an extra button. And hello everyone. I believe now it is true. Click I an extra live button. Streaming to everybody out there uh, in the world watching our YouTube channel. Uh, as I was saying in the chat room, hopefully this is a special at-home edition of the Road to 2000, while the chess club is, for the moment, back on lockdown. Uh, so, on my opening series, Chess Openings Explained, uh, I have been going over the Nidorp opening in the Sicilian. And so it, you know, got me wondering about the history and the, the, the person it's named after, Miguel Nidorp, and... Uh, while I was looking up Miguel Nidorf, he play I found out that he played some really, really interesting games. So tonight, it's going to be all about Nidorf the person, not Nidorf the opening. And we're going to see how he fared against some of the world's best uh, over the past hundred years. So, Nidorf played a ton of very famous people, including one Robert James Fisher. So that is the game I wanted to start off with today. Of course, Miguel Nidorf against good old-fashioned Bobby Fischer. So let's see what happened. Nidorf started with d4. Uh, Fischer plays knight f6. Yes, hello, hello, everyone. Uh, we are finally live here. And we have the uh, King's Indian defense. Nidorf plays e4, as is normal, d6. And after bishop e2 and castles, we are in the quote-unquote uh, classical uh, King's Indian defense. For Nidorf, he's going to get crushed. I wouldn't be so sure. He's a, a pretty strong chess player. Uh, he, he was up there with the world's best at his time, played in a few uh, candidates tournaments, and didn't do so poorly in all of them. Uh, but in this case, rather than knight f3, with kind of the main main line of the classical King's Indian, Nidorf started with bishop g5 first. And now we have c5 from Fisher. So of course, in the King's Indian positions, uh, we have uh, a couple different plans that black can go for. One is after move like knight f3, uh, the most common way to play is e5. And there's this plan in the King's Indian, where black plays the move e5, uh, is going to bring this knight out of the way eventually, and push for something like f5 and f4 to follow, sometimes even bringing this knight to the f4 square himself. Uh, and it definitely makes for an interesting game. After bishop g5, uh, playing e5 makes a little bit less sense here, uh, just because this bishop is going to be really well placed in the ensuing uh, complications. Uh, white could just play d5 and go back into normal territory, but d takes e5 is also going to be an option available. And after this, the move knight d5 is already going to be rather tough for black. In fact, I think knight takes d5 may already be black's best choice, just giving up this entire exchange. So definitely, uh, after bishop g5, e5 makes less sense, which is why we see Fisher go for the second main plan, which is rather than playing e5, Fisher plays the move c5. Now after this, of course, it starts to look less like a king's Indian defense, and more like a typical Benoni-style game. Uh, is Ben Simon on vacation? Uh, unfortunately, the chess club has shut down once again, so I am coming to you from the comfort of my own home. Hopefully you guys are okay with that. Uh, I'm just happy that I'm still able to bring you guys these weekly classes. So c5, and now after d5, uh, we do have just a typical Benoni position. Uh, and now that it is a Benoni, e6 is a very sensible move for black. Uh, challenging the d5 pawn and at least exchanging this e pawn for either the e pawn or the c pawn for white. So e6, we have knight f3, h6, uh, to challenge this bishop a little bit, and rather than stay on this g5 square, where it has the choice of coming back on this diagonal at any moment and the benefit of pinning the knight, the bishop now has to choose if it wants to be on this diagonal or if it wants to continue pinning the knight. Uh, in the game, Nidorf chose uh, bishop h4. Really, either option would have been uh, would have been fine here for white, but uh, Nidorf decides he's going to keep pinning this knight, and the idea behind bishop h4 is not necessarily to just pin this knight forever and ever and ever. It's going to be eventually that this bishop can drop back to g3 
and it's going to have a very nice safe square on g3 to target the d6 pawn. This is going to forever be the problem with the Benoni, it's that this d6 pawn does end up a little bit weak. Why not queen d2 to prevent uh, h6? Queen d2 is actually the most common move here, uh, and probably it's exactly for that reason. Uh, additionally, of course, there are ideas of playing bishop h6, and honestly, I do think queen d2 may be a slightly more accurate move order for uh, for white here. So well spotted, Ragnarok. Uh, yeah, hello to Ethan. Hello, everybody watching live here. Adi, I don't want to spoil who won in the game, but of course, this is a lecture about Nidorf's uh, best games, so that may be some hint to you. We did have knight f3 instead, though, and it's not as if this line is particularly bad for white or anything. I do think it's just slightly less accurate to allow this move h6. Uh, probably white's claim is that h6 isn't really a move that black wanted to play, and so with this pawn on h6 rather than h7, some of the light squares around the black king are going to be slightly more weak. Uh, it's going to make ideas of playing f5 at a later date maybe a little bit less, uh, less comfortable for black. Uh, that being said, just a different line here. E takes d5, c takes d5 is how white chose to recapture. Uh, generally, e takes d5 doesn't offer white a, a huge advantage, especially in situations like this where the bishop can comfortably come out to f5. Need this e pawn here to number one, guard the f5 square, and number two, keep uh, plans of breaking with e5 sort of alive later in the game. G5 now was Bobby Fischer's choice, and this bishop does come back to G3. Uh, now Fischer does something rather interesting here. Uh, there are uh, definitely a couple different ways to play in this position, but I'd like to turn it over to you guys at home. Uh, take a look here, see if you can come up with a couple candidate moves for black. There are uh, really only two moves that are going to be, you know, quote-unquote, the best here. Really worth considering, I think. So what do you guys at home think about this one? David Sun says a6. Ragnarok says knight h5, knight h5. Any other ideas? Besides a6 and knight h5, b6, bishop a6, that is one way to go about things by Manny. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are some pretty good ideas. a6 is very, very thematic for the Benoni, but in this case, uh, black can actually get a better version of playing a6. If you play a6 here, then the move a4 might come, and all of a sudden, uh, b5 is going to be hard to, to attain. Uh, if you play the move knight h5, this is actually the most common way of playing, and I do think this is the best way of playing. And there are actually uh, a number of games that have reached this exact position. Uh, Wang Yue uh, played this against Ding Loren with white. Uh, so Ding Loren had the black pieces here. Wang Hao against Ali Reza Ferruja just last year reached this position. And the one and only Christian Chirilla has actually had this with the white pieces against Alex Fear. Uh, and so this is pretty normal. This is sort of the natural continuation to h6 and g5. Like I said, this bishop is actually well placed on g3, pressuring the d6 pawn. This is a Benoni. Yeah, so we started off in a King's Indian defense and then sort of transposed into the Benoni positions uh, thereafter with this bishop g5 line. Uh, so yeah, as I was saying, this bishop is quite strong on g3, pressuring d6, so knight h5 is really, really natural to just get this guy out of the way and move on with the game. Now, the other move is the move that Bobby Fischer chose, and I do think it's slightly worse here. Fischer actually dared to play the move b5 in one go, which is why the move a6 is sort of uh, not going to be the right idea here, because black is going to be able to just play uh, b5 rather directly. Now, what's the tactical justification behind this? Well, if knight takes b5, this one is rather easy. The move knight takes e4 comes on the board. Black regains the pawn. In fact, regains a center pawn and will have absolutely nothing to fear from this position with the wide open bishop. If bishop takes b5, this one is slightly less obvious, but black can actually still dare to take this e4 pawn when after knight takes e4, queen a5 check is a simple fork 
Knight c3 doesn't do enough because bishop takes c3 is check, and black will at least be regaining the piece. So always be on the lookout for these opportunities to play b5 in one go with the black pieces in the Benoni style positions. Uh, and when I say be on the lookout, I mean with both colors. You have to make sure that uh, you're okay with allowing b5 here if you are going to play sort of in this manner. So b5, fortunately for white, uh, taking on b5 is not forced. Instead, now white does get to play the very natural move that Neidorf plays in the game, which is knight d2. Knight d2 creates the threat of capturing this pawn by defending e4. It also has the very, very, very nice side effect of defending the h5 square, thus securing this bishop here on g3. Uh, okay, continuing on, a6 to defend b5, and now white castles. Rook e8 played in the game, and now I wanted to ask you guys at home to think a little bit in this particular position and try and come up with sort of a plan of action here for white. Uh, there are many different plans in the Benoni that white can go for, uh, and it largely depends on how the specifics of the opening have uh, developed here. So in this case, we do have black getting a6 and b5. Generally, this is sort of seen as favorable for black to have these moves in. We also see black with h6 and g5 included, though. Uh, taking some control of dark squares, but weakening some light squares. And we do have black sitting a little bit underdeveloped with these queen side pieces. Uh, so with all that in mind, try and come up with some kind of plan here for white. Decide how you want to make use of your pieces in this game. What do you guys think? So uh, Mateo has two ideas. One is to play at four, and one is to play a three, and these are are pretty different ideas altogether. Well, I'm very glad to hear that, Gustavo. I'm so glad you enjoy the lectures. As I said, a special at-home edition of the Road to 2000 tonight. Hopefully, you guys are on board with that. And as I've said, we're going over the games of the wonderful Miguel Nidorf. F4 push. So you guys are uh, sort of along the, the right track here. F4 could be difficult with your E4 pawn. So yeah, this is an excellent point. Uh, so you guys are mentioning some really natural Benoni ideas here. So a lot of times in the Benoni, uh, in particular with these pawns back here, let's say we just continued along normal lines. Knight BD7, castles, rookie 8, knight D2. Uh, let's say just b6 or something. f4 in these positions is a very, very common way of playing in just sort of normal Benoni positions. You play f4, the idea is to control the e5 square, you go for e5, you can even go for f5 breaks in many, many cases. Of course, however, that is not the position we have in our game here. In our game here, we have the pawns on h6 and g5 already. And that is, in fact, going to change our, uh, our position slightly. It's going to change our plan slightly. Uh, good evening, Subakura. How are you doing? Uh, Subakura says sound effects. I hope that doesn't mean there is sound playing that shouldn't be. But uh, I think all is well. <laughs> What about h4? Hit the hook. So yeah, Gus, Gus is, uh, Gustavo is referencing, of course, a previous lecture I did regarding hooks in chess. The g5 pawn can be seen as kind of a hook here, but in this case, this is not really going to be our idea. Uh, f4 is kind of an idea worth considering here, but the huge downside to playing f4 when these pawns are already so well placed on h6 and g5 is that if and I'm not saying that this should be played immediately. If this pawn ever does get captured, then all of a sudden, black's pieces, if we give them a couple turns, are going to have sort of this forever home on e5. This is more or less the worst case scenario for white. If you play f4 and the f pawn gets traded off and black gets a strong e5 square for his pieces, 
you're sort of never going to be able to win this game in the center or on the king's side. The e5 square is just too, too critical. So this is why uh, Black's positioning of his pieces are sort of really, uh, really kind of frightening uh, for white if you do want to play this f4 idea. So it's good to keep this one in reserve. There are cases where opening the f file is going to be immediately and tactically winning. So always keep this f4 idea in mind. In this case, though, I don't think it's quite right to go for it sort of directly. Uh, in the game, we'll see Nidorf had a rather different idea. So f4's idea is to control the e5 square, but Nidorf also realized that he could potentially play e5 without playing f4 to support it. And the idea of playing e5 directly is a little bit different than f4. The idea is you're getting rid of this d6 pawn and giving yourself a very strong passed d pawn. So with all of that in mind, queen c2 is what Nidorf started with, uh, over defending this pawn in the case of something like uh, b4 coming. It's good to have this extra defender here. And then Fisher played queen to e7. And now once again, if we can help it, we want to keep this pawn back on f2. We don't really want to make this trade just yet. So the simple rook a to e1 is Nidorf's choice. Just supporting this pawn from behind and going for the e5 push directly without this sort of uh, f4 push. Now after knight b to d7, this next move by white is sort of the, the critical idea as we hear some sirens go by in the background. The next move by white is the critical idea to aid this e5 push. So it's not going to be f4 in this case. f4 is not a terrible move, but it, it is rather risky opening up this diagonal, and it's not the most favorable trade of all time, giving up the e5 square. So. This next idea by white, who thinks they have it? And actually Yaroslav is just so far ahead of me, uh, answering the question before I even asked it. It's the move a4. Uh, and the point of course is you want to sort of overextend these black pawns, not so you can attack them, but so they give up some key squares. In this case, it's going to be the c4 square that is the key square for white to control. So a4 is the uh, important idea here by knight or to gain control in the center. b4 was played, and this knight just retreats all the way back to d1. Knight e5 was Fisher's choice. Once again, this is the natural conclusion of putting these pawns on the dark squares. It's for e5 control, dark square control. Uh, now, rather than play knight c4 immediately, uh, which I think might even hang this pawn, uh, the very nice move, knight e3. Uh, comes on the board by white. The idea being you get the worst knight into the game, the knight on d2 is already serving an important purpose, controlling the e4 square, so you bring the knight from d1 out to c4. Uh, now we have knight g6 played in the game, uh, taking uh, a more defensive approach rather than leave this knight on e5 and have this knight be challenged by the white knights. Fisher retreats this knight so that it can actually control these squares rather than occupy them. Of course, the natural follow-up here is the best move. Just bring this knight in to c4, and now knight f4 was Fisher's idea. So, once again, it is white to move, and this time uh, it is finally going to be time to just break through directly. Of course, the best move here, you have to get rid of this super strong knight on f4, so bishop takes f4, g takes f4, and then wasting no time at all, Nidor plays this move e5, and this is just going to be uh, crushing in this case. Of course, the move knight takes d5 would be highly desirable, but bishop f3 is going to start to give you some very, very awkward problems here on this knight. If bishop b7, look out. Uh, for just knight takes d6 when you can't defend everything all at the same time. For example, rook d8 takes, takes, and uh, I'm not even sure here. Just knight c4. I guess you aren't losing the piece immediately, but of course this is just a dominating position with the knight coming into d6 and the rook coming to d1 to collect. Uh, okay, so not knight takes d5, but rather e d takes e5 is Fisher's choice. And now how do you want to follow up this sacrifice with white? What's the big follow-up here? What do you do? 
Thank you very much, Yaroslav with a Y. There are two Yaroslavs in the chat. Unbelievable. One with a J and one with a Y. I wonder what subtle pronunciation difference I'm missing there. But yeah, thank you very much for the kind words. I'm glad you like those. And those lectures. So d6 and bishop f3 are in fact both very very good moves here but I do like one more than the other in this case. Uh, the point of the e5 sacrifice wasn't to you know sort of crushingly win material through some sort of funny tactic like this. Uh, in this case I think actually just queen e1 is going to be good enough and uh, black has more than enough pieces for the queen here. Uh, the idea, of course, was just to improve all of the white pieces. Bishop f3 played in the game was uh, knight or choice, and I like this one a little bit more because it makes direct threats to this pawn, and it is sort of just the solidifying move that white needed to hold everything together. Now, e4 is never a threat, knight e4 is coming on the board uh, quickly, the rook has been opened up, this knight has freedom to go wherever it wants, and this is just sort of devastating now for black. Uh, queen f8 was played by Fisher in the game, but that of course just gives up the e5 pawn. And now after bishop b7, the knight number two comes into the game and it's, it's quite close to game over here. Uh, once again, tactically, you cannot t capture this pawn because of uh, funny business here. Wait a second, so bishop takes would be the better try and after knight takes knight takes the move knight d7 is believe it or not a trapped queen just straight up this queen has no squares and if knight takes d5 well then knight d7 immediately is also going to get the job done uh, devastating stuff for black so knight c4 taking away the queen's last square an excellent move by Nidorf. now rook a to d 8 and uh, the, the move here that uh, I think justifies bishop f3 being slightly better than the move d6 is uh, it, it does allow knight of this option to put this knight on c6. Uh, it's all about making the most out of this d-pawn uh, on the d6 square. It would do a very good job of hampering the black pieces, but on the d5 square, it does a great job of defending the c6 square as well. And Nidorf uses this to his advantage in order uh, to improve his pieces even further. Put this knight onto, onto c6. Now, of course, this rook is attacked, so there's no time to take this pawn. Rook takes e1 was Fisher's choice. Rook takes e1, rook e8, going for some trades. And in this case, uh, Nidorf is just very, very happy to leave these rooks on the board and goes for rook d1. And the path to victory is becoming quite clear. Uh, rook c8 was played in the game. And at this point, uh, white has such a dominating position that he can kind of spend all the time he wants. Uh, Nidorf plays the move h3. Uh, rather mean, if I'm being honest with you. Knight e8 was Fisher's try to try and regain some control here. Now knight 6 to a5 is challenging this bishop, rook b8, the queen comes into f5, and this is just a dream position. Uh, knight d6, knight takes d6, was the end of the game, as Fisher is just blundering material here with knight d6 to, uh, to a tactic. This was sort of the point of queen f5, queen takes d6, we have knight d7, rook b7, and queen c8, and this is just deadly. Uh, so what was the point of me in showing you this game other than to everybody applaud how smart Nidorf is? Well, this is sort of the uh, epitome of Benoni wins with the white pieces. This is sort of what the ideal Benoni win looks like. Uh, what do I mean by that? Well, you just improve your pieces, take advantage of the squares that your opponent gives you, and then you push e5 and win with a strong d5 pawn. This is sort of the core of the main, main, main Benoni plans, and Nidorf executed it, executed it perfectly in, in this particular case. So once again, it's all about mobilizing this d pawn in these Benoni positions, and that's exactly what Nidorf was able to do. 
Uh, and once again, it all starts back here with coming up with your plan before you really start uh, moving the pieces around out of the opening. Uh, you want to have some idea of what you are actually playing for and what you're trying to accomplish before you start uh, moving, moving the pieces some more. In this case, knight earth understood it was queen c2, defending this pawn, a4, knight c4, and pushing e5. And that's the plan that he came up with and then executed, and Fisher was more or less helpless to, uh, to stop him here. Who actually still plays modern Benoni nowadays uh, among the strong GMs? Well, Fisher didn't try. Fisher tried to uh, tried to play King's Indian, but this Bishop G5 move is more or less really asking for the Benoni, unless uh, Black is trying to play some move like Knight A6 here, which I guess is what you would likely more see uh, nowadays. He definitely deserves it. Uh, I tend to agree here. I tend to agree. But yeah, Fisher went c5, which is actually uh, pretty common. And after d5, he did get into a Benoni. At what age was Fisher then? Uh, let me do some math. I think this game was played in 1966, unless I'm mistaken. Let me check really quick here. Yeah, 1966. So do your own math there. I don't remember when Fisher was born, but this was played in 1966. So uh, not too far away from 1972 when he was winning world championships, but I guess he was pretty reasonably young. Okay, of course it wouldn't be uh, a lecture about Miguel Nidorf if I didn't include a game in the Nidorf. Uh, so the game we just looked at was Bobby Fischer with the black pieces against Miguel Nidorf. Uh, Nidorf, of course, is the topic of tonight's lecture. And now this is a game between La Lejos, Lajos, I don't know how to say his name, Steiner against Miguel Nidorf. And this, of course, is going to be his signature opening. We have the Sicilian, and after d4, takes, takes, knight f6, knight c3. Uh, here, a6 would bring us into the main line, Nidorf. Did Bobby lose? Bobby did lose. He resigned after knight d6. <clears throat> ah, I'm glad you are enjoying it, Gita. I am glad you're a fan. And here, actually, Nidorf did not play a6, instead choosing e6, but we very quickly transposed from the Scheveningen after bishop g5 and a6. Uh, now, this is well and truly just the bishop g5 Nidorf. Uh, where black goes e6 after bishop g5. So we could have arrived here by the more normal move order, a6, bishop g5, e6. This is normally how these things go, but e6 first, and now a6 is the knight orf. So of course the most topical line, even back in those days, was this move f4, and this is what was played here today. And now there are various ways for black to approach this move. Uh, the idea for white is generally to push something like f5 and try and checkmate the black king in these types of lines. And so one of the most popular variations, as uh, Subakura is recommending, is to play queen b6 and go for the poisoned pawn, where black is capturing this pawn on the b2 square and getting checkmated for it. Uh, these days, I think this move h6 is sort of a subtlety that uh, MVL has started including, where after bishop h4 and queen b6, we get the same variation, but the bishop's on h4 rather than g5, and this matters for some reason. If you want to know all the subtleties on that, uh, stay tuned for more chess openings explained lectures, where I'm going to keep going through the knight orf, and I'll tell you all about the differences here. But we didn't see any of that in today's game. Uh, in this case, knight orf played the move knight b to d7 which uh, I think is an okay variation for black. I do know a lot less about this particular one than I do about the poison pawn stuff. But bishop c4 was his opponent's response. These days, queen f3 or queen e2 is a little bit more common, but we have bishop c4 here. And the point of this move is sort of uh, saying, you know, I'm going to take your e6 pawn. You better be very, very, very careful. And Nidorf sort of leaned into it here, played the move b5. Uh, now, it is a rather complex position where bishop takes e6 has actually been played before by some very, very strong players, including, I believe, uh, Nidich and I think Adiban 
with the white pieces, the beast. And after fe6, knight e6, queen a5, uh, things get rather complicated. Knight takes f8, uh, rook takes f8, not king takes f8. Queen d6, king f7, e5, b4, e6 check, king g8, ed, bishop d7, takes, 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 rook d8, queen h3, b takes c3. Was enough for a draw in knightage against uh, Neji uh, back in 2010, but we didn't actually see any of this today. That's just to show you some crazy stuff can happen after bishop takes e6. So if you want to play like this with the black pieces, you, you pretty much have to know what you're doing. In this game, though, the much simpler bishop b3 was white's choice, sort of uh, shying away from the bishop takes e6 challenge. Uh, and now, knight c5 was played by Nidorf, and looking back, this move was probably just a bit of a mistake. White can actually get a pretty significant advantage, as we'll see in the game. Uh, the best move here has been played before, and that is just to go bishop b7. What's the difference? Well, the difference is you are much better prepared to meet the move e5, in this case, because your knight has not gone to c5, so you are just directly controlling this square. After knight c5, obviously now the best move is going to be e5, uh, as this knight has left the protection of the e5 pawn. Uh, if you are a fan of Maurice Ashley, you've probably heard the term Aikido chess. This is a favorite term of his, uh, and that means sort of, uh, gosh, I'm, my memory is failing me on the exact meaning, but it's sort of the idea that every move has positives, in this case attacking e4, attacking the bishop on b3, but every move also has drawbacks, in this case no longer defending the e5 square. So oftentimes you'll find that the best move after your opponent's move is to take advantage of the drawback that they've left behind. The drawback being this e5 pawn, this e5 square is a lot uh, less directly controlled by the knight on c5. And that's exactly the case here. The best move for white is the move played in the game, e5. And now black is in serious trouble, right? This is a pin, and this is a pawn attacking the pinned piece. You're going to be in a little bit of trouble. Uh, in the game, we have d takes e5 and f takes e5. And now black's idea was to go queen c7 with the point of meeting uh, e takes f6 with the move queen e5 check. Uh, unfortunately, while this tactic works, uh, white does just end up in a very, very good position as this line uh, reaches its sort of natural conclusion. So if e takes f6, queen e5 check, queen e2, and either queen takes g5 or queen takes d4. If queen takes d4, you're asking for trouble. So queen takes g5 is the better move, but now simply castles and white is... is Kind of dominating here. If knight takes b3 in order to give the bishop a square, knight takes b3, guards the square, and after the natural move, bishop b7 to create threats, knight a5 is highlighting just how pinned down the black pieces are, and this is going to be rather difficult for black to survive. Uh, fortunately for Nidorf in the game, uh, his opponent sort of believed him and didn't go in for this queen e5 and queen takes g5 nonsense. Probably because it isn't the most natural thing in the world to give up this bishop on g5. This is a very strong uh, attacking piece placed right here, and white just renews the threat with the move queen e2. Uh, unfortunately though for white, now the defensive move knight f to d7 is enough to kind of just equalize here with the black pieces. Uh, once again, this is Steiner against Miguel Nidorf in, believe it or not, the Nidorf. Uh, now, it, it is a rather complicated position. White could sort of keep the balance by queenside castling here, and this does just give up this e5 pawn if black chooses to capture it, but of course black is going to have to be ready to face these threats on the e-file, gonna have to play a move like f6, and there's plenty of problems to solve here with black in the form of developing the remainder of these pieces. Uh, Black could also try, or white could also try an interesting move, bishop d5. The point being, if you play bishop b7, white is just going to capture this piece. And now this knight on c5 is looking a little bit empty without this bishop on b3 to take advantage of. 
but probably the move rook b8 here. And after queenside castles, this is just going to be some horrific mess. Uh, in the game, though, we do actually see not bishop d5, but knight d5 by white. And the idea that I didn't mention, if black just captures this, is of course that the move e6 is going to be rather strong for white. Same idea uh, as bishop d5 here. Uh, yeah, Gustavo. So, uh, of course, the down the drawback to knight c5 is undefending the e5 square, and so the best move in some cases is going to be to take advantage of that. And uh, that's not always the best move, but it is a perfectly valid way of trying to play. Uh, and yet, yeah, turns out this is actually going to be pretty good for white in this case. If you take this guy, we will take back, and if you take this guy again, look out, you are getting checkmated in two. So pretty nasty stuff. In the game, uh, Nidorf plays the best move, which is just to step out of the way. And sometimes this is the, the best way to go uh, when you're facing down these complex variations like the move knight d5. Uh, a huge issue that a lot of people have when they're calculating forcing variations is they sort of already assume that captures is going to be played. You know, it's a pretty natural thing to do. Say, okay, I play knight d5, my opponent takes, I play e6, he takes, I take on e6, and then I win, right? Knight e6, queen e6, it's mate in two. But, of course, captures are not forced in chess, and when you place a piece on a square where it's hanging, sort of the risk you run is that even if your opponent doesn't capture that piece, it's going to be hanging on the next turn as well. And if you don't sort of deal with this threat, then perhaps your opponent can improve his position to the point where uh, capturing this piece is actually going to be good. So in a sense, while knight d5 gains a tempo on the queen, knight d5 is actually a loss of tempo for white. What do I mean by that? Uh, I mean that white now owes black a move, right? Before white does other things, he's going to have to eventually move this knight off of this square where it's attacked on d5. So I think that pretty much just uh, makes knight d5 a bad move. Now, obviously, in some positions, these types of moves are just, you know, phenomenal and even winning. But those positions sort of rely on the fact that the knight uses d5 as a jumping off point. It uses d5 to get somewhere. In this case, this knight on d5 has nowhere to go, right? These are not, this is not a jumping off point for this knight. You know, this knight has nothing to do from d5 uh, jumping into these squares. So that's what makes knight d5 a bad move. And I think that is the most instructive move of this entire game. Uh, knight d5 being a sort of fatal mistake here for white, because it is, in a sense, just a loss of tempo. Uh, okay, with all that in mind, white castled queenside, and now is finally the time for black to take advantage of this knight sitting here on the d5 square. Now, does that mean e takes d5 is the best move in this position, or does that mean something else? You tell me, chat room. What do you think you would play here if you had the black pieces? What would you do here with black? Would you rise to the occasion and take this knight now? Or is there some way to improve your position before taking on d5? So don't just give me one move. Give me, uh, you know, why you're playing these moves. 1200, so e takes d5. Knight takes b3, then queen takes is interesting. Yaro says knight takes b3. So how does knight takes b3 help you? What are you doing after knight b3, a b3? Are you capturing this knight then? What's the difference? What's the difference? So Montenegro just wants to take the bishop and then try to castle. So I assume he's developing this bishop out and just trying to castle kingside h6 to take away the strong bishop. Mm -hmm. 
So I will tell you guys that you are not quite on the right track here. Um, it would be great if queen takes d5 were perfectly legal, but knight takes b3 is legal. And then you're definitely not playing uh, queen takes d5 here when the rook on d1 is controlling the square. So after this, now would you capture on d5 or is something different? So Subakura has a fantastic line, and that is yes, now you can capture on d5. If a b3 or c b3, then queen d5 is going to be a great move for black, as you guys were suggesting. But knight b3, e takes d5. The key point now is you've drawn this knight away from its defense of the e6 square. So the move e6 really drops in power. Now after e6, as Subakura mentioned, the only move for black to maintain an advantage in fact, the only move to not lose is knight f6. The point being you uh, cut this bishop off, and after e takes f7, king takes f7, uh, it is going to be an extra piece for black. Definitely, the complications are not yet over, as there are some issues on the f file, for example, rook f1, queen h5 threats, but an extra piece is an extra piece here, and black is doing quite well. Now, in the game, uh, Neudorf actually went for a different line, not taking on b3, but rather did h6. And this has a very, very similar idea. The idea is this improves black's position after bishop h4 to the point where e takes d5 is now going to be uh, a playable move. So as I said, this is the danger when you put your knight on d5, even if you calculate accurately that your opponent taking your knight is winning for you, on the first turn. The issue is, if your opponent can just sort of dodge the threats, you're going to have to be calculating e takes d5 on every turn and in every potential position that your opponent can, can sort of achieve after, uh, after the capture. So this is why I think white ends up losing this game. What's the difference with h6 and bishop h4 on the board? Well now after e6, the move knight b6 comes on the board. And if e takes f7, king takes f7, check, and king g8. And now uh, now black is safe. Let's compare this with what would have happened with the bishop on g5. It takes e6, knight b6, e takes f7, king takes f7, rook f1 check, king g8. Well, here, unfortunately, uh, the move rook takes f8 would be winning, with the idea being rook f1 check, King g8, queen e8 is mate instead of not checkmate. And this is sort of the, the really, really deep idea behind h6. So if you guys notice this, then you guys are kind of super geniuses along the level of Nidorf. But uh, personally, this idea was not obvious to me at all. Uh, once again, the difference being now after knight e6 takes takes check here, the move rook takes f8 is just a losing move because king takes f8, check, king g8, check is no longer mate because the king has a flight square on h7. And oops, I think I just messed everything up. Is that the case? Okay, hopefully it's all back to normal. Okay, perfect. So this, as I said, I can't stress enough, the reason white lost this game is because uh, if you leave this knight sitting on d5, then your opponent is going to have so many different options to get a slightly different version of taking on d5, and odds are one of those is going to be uh, just good for him, you know, taking this extra piece. So when you play moves like knight d5, you have to be ready to justify it in the case of many, many, many uh, different choices for your opponent. And in this case, knight Earth goes up a piece, Queen e8 was played in the game, and then a very nice move by Nidorf here, bishop f5, putting this bishop on a square where it's attacked by two different pieces, but interfering with the rook's access to f8 while hitting the queen. A fantastic defensive move. This queen came back to e5, and now the bishop tucks itself away back on g6, and this king has never been safer. Knight e6 comes on the board, black is now happy to trade, up a piece, queen takes e6, king h7. And now the game is sort of just over. Bishop f2, knight c4, h4, and this is just sort of desperation by white, but black is just up a clean full piece with no real issues around his king. Uh, rook e8 
activates this rook. The queen drops back to h3. We see queen c8 now, trying to trade queens. g4, desperately keeping queens on. Now knight a5 is just trading pieces and threatening checkmate as well. Uh, h5 played in the game, and now knight takes b3 with check would be playable, but queen b3 defends the mate, so just bishop e4, c3, now we take, bishop e7, and as I said, this is, this is all kind of just dead lost now for white. Black activates his final piece, and the game ends uh, pretty quickly thereafter. Oops, sorry. Uh, b4 played in the game, bishop d2, b takes c3, b takes c3, and checkmates. And Nidorf defeats his opponent in his namesake opening line. Uh, so hopefully you guys really enjoyed these two games by Miguel Nidorf. Uh, I found them to be rather instructive games. Uh, the first one, the key idea being being uh, being formulating this plan based on the subtle differences in the structure. And the key idea in this game uh, is being able to take advantage of an opponent's faulty sacrifice, not necessarily by capturing it immediately, but by first ignoring it and then taking it on your own terms when you've calculated a line that's an improved version for you. And let this be a cautionary tale for those uh, Sicilian players with the white pieces. If you want to sacrifice your pieces, you are more than welcome to, but be aware your opponent doesn't always have to take them. Uh, right after this, we are actually going to do another lecture here on YouTube. Hopefully I get it uh, to, to start on time. I had some tech difficulties on my own here uh, to, with the Road to 2000, but hopefully that all goes well over on the end game class. It's going to be a little bit more of a beginner focused class, so if you're on the newer end to chess, be sure to check that one out. Uh, with all that in mind, thank you very much for joining me tonight on the Road to 2000. As always, my name is National Master Caleb Denby. I have been your driver on this journey.